good evening and good night, friends and colleagues from around the world. Today we have uh, uh, in our second session another one of our favorites after Dr. Gordon Christensen, uh, a true entrepreneur, a true motivation to many uh, male and female uh, professionals across the world. Uh, Dr. Gina Dorfman, hosted by uh, Dr. Sandeep Singh from India. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you so much, Keno, and uh, good evening, everybody from India. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gina, for being it's a with us. It's to be here. I'm very excited. So thank you. And for the miracle of the day to have uh, Dr. Gordon Christensen and Dr. Dorfman at the same time on the very day we make 1 million uh, views and uh, reaches to our colleagues is uh, astonishing. Um, and uh, given that uh, India and the United States is where the majority of the viewership has come from, uh, we have a very uh, interesting day and uh, session before us. But uh, to officially begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandeep Singh, who is a regent, a board member, uh, as well as many other things in the dental profession. Dr. Sandeep Singh is president and international board member of WAUPS Southeast Asia, an organization of ultrasonic, piezoelectric, bone surgery, and growth factors. As director of dental health and sciences, Shuat University, Allahabad, India, he works to develop and promote piezoelectric bone surgery and growth factors and in organizing conferences around the world, lectures and workshops on vertical and horizontal 3D, 3D bone augmentation procedures. Dr. Singh graduated in dentistry from Amravati University, India, completed his residency at AIIMS, New Delhi, and his mastership in implantology at UCLA, California. He's also a certified trainer for endodontic procedures from Malifer Institute, Densply, Serona, Switzerland. And if that's not enough, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you happen to travel from the United States to an international conference, look around all the corners, because somewhere you'll see him pop up talking to somebody, working with somebody on something, and it never uh, fails to uh, amaze me that how active this man is. With that said, uh, Dr. Uh, Sandeep Singh, you have the floor to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, thank you, Keno. <clears throat> Good evening, friends. Today we have Dr. Gina Doffman. Uh, she, she, she is an entrepreneur, she is a dental surgeon. Uh, she has practiced. She's practice owner. She has uh, more than uh, two practices, and uh, uh, she she had the opportunity to engage with dental professionals across the country with the goal of helping them grow and thrive. And she graduated from the University of Southern California in 1996, so almost more than two decades. Um, uh, earning a degree in biochemistry first. And then she got her dental training uh, from Harmon Ostro School of Dentistry, that is University of Southern California. And uh, let me tell you, Gina, that I got a chance to be there. And I know quite a few people over there, Dr. Sajib Raj there and uh, Dr. Zeeb Simon uh, is a good friend of mine. And, um, and then after finishing her dental school, uh, she started her practice near Los Angeles, California. Uh, the, the main thing which she's going to tell us ab uh, about today is um, something different from dentistry, but related to dentistry. So something very unique. She is the COO of a company, YAPI, YAPI. Yeah, it's a practice management software. And uh, uh, she, she got into this thing in the year, uh, I believe uh, it was 2010. And uh, definitely uh, before, uh, because we have to start the session, I will definitely, Dr. Gina, I'm gonna ask you that what made you come down into this uh, along with your dental uh, practice? And uh, she, she, I believe she loves to write. So she do, does a lot of blogs, write a lot of blogs. And without taking much of her, and she's a, uh, she has a family and she, uh, uh, she enjoys 
hiking, reading, and spending time with her husband, um, Ken, I believe. His name is Ken. And they have uh, two, two children there, Mila and Lenny. And, and uh, she is a dog lover. She has a, a German Shepherd named Axel. And I do have a German Shepherd. Uh, um, his name is Leo. So that's, awesome. uh, <laughs> that's great. And uh, I would like you to now, um, I'm handing it over to Dr. Gina Dorfman so that she can start her presentation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much for this um, for this introduction. Um, to answer your question, I got into software because I sort of scratched my own itch. I started the practice in a very busy market, uh, very saturated market, and we knew that we had to be efficient if we wanted to be um, productive. And so, one of the things that um, you know I've always struggled with is how inefficient our current software was. And so um, I had lots of ideas. I talked to my dad, who was a software developer. Um, at the time, he was working for Toshiba. And uh, he created custom software for my practice, which later became this Yappy. <laughs> and when I started to share it with my friends, um, a lot of them said, oh, we would love to have that in our practices. And so that's eventually it grew into a business. So it was never an intention. Um, but uh, some, sometimes some of the best things happen when we try to solve our own problems. So that's that's the story. So probably we are going to uh, listen to today with all your experience. We are going to hear it out and then we come up with a, um, um, a beautiful question and answer session. After. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. my presentation is about running a business. I have a busy practice. I am also running a busy software company. And one of the things that I've learned over time is that um, your business is about the people who are running the business for you because you can't do everything yourself. And that's what the presentation is all about. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, okay, well, I'll get your presentation up. Uh, one thing that, uh, very nice introduction of our uh, keynote speaker today, Dr. Singh. One thing Thank we you. forgot to mention is that she is about the kindest human being you can uh, uh, possibly run into, having to gotten to know her over the, over the months. And we are very honored to have her with us. And uh, uh, Dr. Dorfman, uh, you have the floor. If you want to go full screen mode, uh, please proceed. Oh. Excellent. So um, we're going to talk about being a CEO today, which means that we need to build our practices that can run without us, not around us. Now, that doesn't mean that um, you are not in the practice. That just means that you can focus on what's important to you, probably your patients, and the practice is going um, to run itself. Now, the problem is, is that I know so many dentists who are always saying, writing a practice is hard, business is hard. I don't know how to manage people. Um, I don't know how to motivate employees. But the thing is that business doesn't have to be hard, but we make it harder on ourselves because we never take the time to build our culture. We never take the time to build our team. We never take time to build scalable systems in our practices so that our practices can actually run without our daily input. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Michael Gerber wrote a book and in his book, he said, if your business requires your presence, you don't have a business, you have a job. And in fact, many of us, most of us, have many jobs. We have the job of a dentist, what Michael Gerber calls the technician, right? We produce most of the dentistry that happens in our practices. And we have the job of a manager. We got the carrots and the whip, and we are constantly managing and motivating people. And we're also those know-it-alls that answer all of the questions in the practice. Every single question that needs to be answered, 
goes through us because we know everything and no one else can make a decision. And we're firefighters because whenever something goes wrong, we're putting out the fires. And in fact, the day, the way that our days happen is whenever something happens, our attention immediately goes to that thing and all of the important things that we need to work on go to the side because we're busy dealing with the incoming. And we're the big bosses, right? We, we make all of the decisions and, and we, we, set, we, we set how the practice is going to run. And in fact, all of this is very, very stressful. And some days we're nothing more than hamsters on this wheel, perpetual wheel of life. We're juggling everything that's important and urgent, constantly doing and, and, and deciding and telling and managing and motivating. And, and that's what our life is. And in fact, we know that we should start delegating things. I mean, think about it. How many of you know that you need to be a better delegator? But here's what happens. We tell ourselves that no one else is going to do it better than us. I mean, that's a tape that we play in our minds. We say, yes, sure, I can find someone else to do it, but I know how to do it and I can do it best. And by the time it takes me to find someone and train them and explain how I want things done and go through all of the learning curves, by that time, it's just easier to make to do it ourselves, right? That's what you tell yourselves. You say it's easier to do it ourselves. And we also know that we need to create scalable systems. But here's the problem. We don't have time to do it because we're constantly juggling and running and managing and motivating and solving problems and putting out fires. But if we took the time to create the systems, we would have fewer fires or we would have a system to prevent those fires or we would have a system that our team could use to solve the fires without our input. But we don't take time to do it. So you know what? It's time to take control. It's time that we build systems within each business function and we let systems run the business and the people run the systems. People come and go, but the systems remain constant. Michael Gerber. But here's one problem. There's one problem with systems. Systems are great and we must build them. But here's one problem. A good friend of mine, a fellow dentist, Dr. Mark Costa says, Without leadership, all systems fail. So let's talk about leadership for a second. What is leadership? Leadership is a series of behaviors rather than a role for heroes. Margaret Whitley. See, many of us say, well, I'm not a natural leader. A natural born leader, we assume that leaders are born. But leaders are not born. Leaders are trained. Leaders become leaders over time when they learn some essential leadership skills. Let's talk about those skills. What are those skills? Or rather behaviors. First, we must share, we must create and share our vision. I mean, if we expect people to come to work and create the practice of our dreams, they need to see what we see. Our vision has to trickle down to them, right? And we have to define our core values. We have to hire the right people. We have to set clear expectations with those people. And finally, we must create the environment of autonomy and responsibility where we treat employees like adults, where we create the culture of thinkers where we give permission to, to, to our employees to make decisions and we provide direction, development, and safety. Easier said than done, right? Let's talk about this. Cameron Harold um, said, the reason why companies spend so much time managing people is because nobody knows where they're going. And it is so true. It is so true in any business, and it is particularly true in a dental practice. 
So I learned the concept of the vivid vision from Cameron, uh, from Cameron Harold. A vivid vision is nothing more than a three, four, five page document that we create to sort of outline our vivid vision. Now, it's not our mission statement. I mean, let's, let's think about the mission statements. How, when we create mission statements, what does it sound like? Uh, usually something like, in, in our practice, we take care of people, we treat patients like um, family. It's a caring, a community. We, we, we find those big words that we like, nice words, right? And we string them together into a sentence. But the truth is that they're very generic. There's just not enough information. So a vivid vision is a very detailed plan. Now imagine you get in a time machine and you travel three years out. You land in front of your practice. You come out. What do you see? What does your practice look like? What does your science say? What does your marketing say? What do your online reviews say about your practice? And as you walk inside and, and you, you look at the lobby, who are the patients in that practice? Who, are, who, who is working in that practice? Hi, Sandeep, you're having a little technical issue. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, maybe you can, uh, meanwhile, while I get Gina back, uh, you can uh, discuss a little bit about your uh, wonderful project you've been doing with the legends. And yeah. uh, I'll help her with the technical aspects. Yes, yes. Hi, friends, there's some technical glitch coming down, so nothing to worry, she's coming back. Dr. Gina is back. Uh, before she comes here, uh, let me tell you about, uh, uh, I have been, um, um, along with the Global Summit, uh, because I was, um, uh, I became the part of uh, uh, the board at the initial days, and um, I'm really proud of that, that uh, um, I, I, I'm one of the board members there, and we have been doing uh, trying to get into this uh, uh, global summit. And then this time we decided that we need to be there on, online and uh, make it a wonderful goal to bring in 100, more than 100 uh, speakers on board. Along with that, I was doing some, um, um, I started some, because I have an academy here it's by the name Sehez Dental Academy, and um, we get a, a a lot of international uh, experts onto that. Uh, so it, the idea came to me and uh, I started a pro project by, yeah, here. Uh, she's back, Dr. Gina. Don't get a little coffee break there. Everybody got some cookies. Let's get back. Where did you lose Could you go back to your presentation and we'll pull it up? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Sahaj, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Singh was talking Sunday. about Sahaj Academy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was like uh, I came up with this idea, and the first thing I got a chance was from Dr. Joseph Khan, Professor Dr. Joseph Khan, who is an amazing guy. And then came in Professor Z. Major, then came in Professor Daniel Kadropoli, and then my favorite, Dr. Daniel Boozer, and we had a fantastic session uh, with him for more than two and a half hour. And after that, then we came uh, with Attila Bodrogi from um, Budapest, Hungary. Amazing photography, amazing cases. And along with that, I had uh, my friend, Dr. Lanka Mahesh and Dr. Udat Kher, who has written a book and Dr. Tarun Kumar, and with my team, um, uh, Dr. Babho and uh, Dr. Chakshwesh, Dr. Govind, Dr. Deepak, Satish Kamboj. You know, I, I really believe into this thing with what Prof Professor Daniel Boozer says, that <clears throat> you, you cannot do something without the team effort. So it, with the Global Summit and with 
my talk show, Meet the Legends. <clears throat> it was all it was all team effort, and then uh, uh, then came in uh, the duo, power pack duo of Dr. Snashana Paul and uh, Dr. Harvey Gluckman, and it was amazing session on uh, socket shield technique and uh, GBR when and where to do that and then um, uh, then came in uh, dr scott gans um, on 35 years of uh, 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 digital workflow and uh, uh, imaging so here we are back again with uh, gina and uh, let's continue um, um, and we are very sorry for the technical problem. It, uh, it happens. It happens, and we got Dr. Dorfman back. Uh, Dr. Dorfman, um, okay, there we go. Perfect. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sandeep, about uh, the wonderful effort that you're doing with Sahaj Dental Academy and the countless leaders and icons you have uh, interviewed in the last few weeks. We appreciate everything you do for dentistry. Thank you. Okay, so, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry about the 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 little coffee break there. Um, we were talking about creating vivid vision. So I'm going to start from the from the beginning because I'm not quite sure where um, where you lost me. Um, a vivid vision is a concept that I heard from um, Cameron Harold. Uh, a vivid vision is. Um, simply a three maybe four or five page document that describes what your practice is going to look like in great detail three years from now imagine getting into a time machine and traveling three years out you land in front of your practice what do you see what does your practice look like what does your science say what does your marketing say what do your online reviews say about your practice and as you go inside who are your patients what is your practice known for? What specialties do you have? Do you have associates? Do you have a partner? Do you have more than one practice? Who are your employees? You have to go through every single area of your practice and you have to document what you want this practice to be like. And you have to write it in a way as though it's already happening to get today. Now, your vivid vision is not your mission statement. Think about our mission statements. How do we create our mission statements? We take some words that we like, like care, community, comfortable, and you would string them together in the longest sentence. Like, you know, in our practice, we treat patients like family. We create comfortable and caring environment for our patients and our community. But is that enough information for your employees to run your practice without you? No, it's not. So you have to create this vivid vision, and then you have to share this vivid vision with your employees. When they see your vision, when your vision trickles down to them, when they know exactly which direction your practice is, is growing, they can all get aligned and they can start rowing together in the same direction to build your practice. That's very important. And the best part is, is that this practice is going, this vivid vision is going to become like a magnet for the right people in your practice. The right employees are going to get attracted to your vision and the wrong people are going to repel, just like with a magnet. And that's the beauty of, of creating a vivid vision. And then we're gonna build a culture. Because as Tony Shea said, the founder of Zappos, if you get the culture right, everything else will fall into place. So let's talk a little bit about culture. What is office culture? Do, does your practice have a culture? The answer is yes, because you know what? Every organization has a culture. Now, culture can form in two different ways. It's either something that you deliberately create, painstakingly, carefully, you put this together, you curate it, you nurture it. Or what happens more commonly in most practices is that our culture just sort of spontaneously results from different people and attitudes and behaviors that we have on our team. And you, your culture doesn't result from good intentions of the practice owner. You know, it doesn't spontaneously happen when you put, um, 
you know, posters on, on your walls and, and talk about excellence and, and, and community and care and comfort. Now remember, the number one value of Enron was integrity, right? For those of you who, who are a little older, who remember the, the days of Enron, their number one value was integrity. So it's not enough to talk about this. The way we create culture is we outline our core values, then we have to lift them. Our core values are going to become the filter through which we make every decision in the practice. In fact, we make hiring decisions using our core values because it's a lot easier to hire people who already exhibit our core values than to hire a bunch of misfits and then try to train them and, and try to get them to exhibit our core values, right? So the first step in creating your culture is to define your core values. These are the core values that we have at Yappy. Do the right thing. Exceptional service, we jump through the hoops for our customers. Stepping up to the bet, taking responsibility. Respect, <coughs> excuse me, respecting the team. Thinking positively, moving forward, growing, and always having fun. See, we've defined those values and then every time we make a decision, we have to make sure that that decision satisfies one of those core values. And every time we hire someone, every time we make a hiring decision, we have to make sure that the new hire um, already exhibits those values. Now, here's the truth. You're not going to get a whole bunch of people that have all of these core values. So you have to decide which ones are the deal breaker and which ones are not. For me, the ones at the top are the most important. I won't hire anyone who doesn't know how to take responsibility. I won't hire anyone who doesn't believe in jumping through the hoops for the customers. I don't keep any employee who doesn't respect the team or doesn't respect our customers. Now, I also hope that, that, that anyone I hire can have fun and grow, but these are less important core values. And you have to categorize this and you have to determine what's important because as Jim Collins said, get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. Great book, Good to Great, is one of the best, it's a classic. But here's the problem. He never explained how to do this. He never explained how to get the right people on the bus. He never explained how to determine who the wrong people are and how to get them off the bus. And he never explained the concept of the right people in the right seats. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about getting the right people on the bus. Now, how do we know we have the right people? Because these people have those values. And if they don't exhibit those values, they're the wrong people. We have to get them off the team, right? Now, imagine doing this. Imagine putting this graphic together. On the y-axis, we have the results, and on the x-axis, we have core values. Imagine putting your employees into one of those boxes. What do you do if you have someone who, who gives you high results and, and, and exhibits all of our core values? That's your all-star employee, right? This is the employee that you, you keep and you nurture and you help them grow and you do whatever you can to retain those employees, to find them and to retain them. But what happens if you have someone down here? They don't fit your core values and they don't really give you good results. They're not the right fit, right? You let them go, it's easy. You do it with dignity, you have to treat people right, but they have to go. What about down here, your B team? They have the right values but they're just not giving you the right results. Now, this is a tricky one, right? Because they have the right values, so you don't wanna lose these people. Maybe they need training. We don't train enough in dental offices. We don't train enough in dental offices. I just said it twice because it's, it's critical. We hire someone and we put them on the phone the first day. In Chick-fil-A, which is a, a, a restaurant that serves chicken, 
that are famous for their customer service. They don't put anyone to work on the first day. There's two weeks of training. In our company, Yappy, the company where I'm CEO, we don't put anyone on the phone the first couple of weeks. In fact, they go through four weeks of training before they're answering the phone for the first time. And yet in our dental office, we hire someone, we put them on the phone the very first day they're hired. And the phone is the most important instrument in our office. That's how all of the new patients form our impression or their impression of our practice, right? And we put that untrained person on the phone. And then we complain about our team a lot. Now, if you find someone who has the right core values, give them training. Make sure that you are clearly communicating with them. Make sure they're well trained. And then if they're still not performing well, then check to make sure they're in the right seat. This is what um, Collins was talking about. You have to make sure that your employees are in the right seats. Someone might have a perfect fit um, as far as values, but they're in the wrong job. Maybe this assistant is not, and actually that happened to me. I, before dental school, I worked in the dental office and I started as a filing clerk, um, which is probably why um, I ended up creating paperless software. I hated filing. Um, Yappy is, um, and you see the logo on the bottom, that's that's the software that um, that we've created. Um, but after that, I became assist an assistant and I was the worst, the worst assistant ever. So somehow they ended up moving me to the front and I flourished. I enjoyed the work so much. In fact, to this day, if this dentistry thing doesn't work out, I'd probably go to insurance billing. Love doing that. So make sure that if you have the person who is fitting your core values, make sure they're in the right seat. And then they will move from the B team to your star team. But what about this? You know, this might be your prima donna hygienist. She's really good with patients. Patients love her. And that's why you won't fire her. Even though she doesn't do anything she's, that, that you ask her to do. She's always complaining. She never has enough time for anything. And she doesn't get along with the rest of the team. Or it may be that front office person. She's great with insurance billing, but she doesn't have a great personality. So what do you do? See, this is the tricky one. This is the hardest one because you're getting the results. This person is not bad enough to, to fire. But the problem is that this person doesn't fit your core values. And as long as you keep her, everything else will not be working out. This is when we start talking about the business is hard. I don't know how to manage people. I don't know how to motivate employees. We're trying to motivate the wrong people and it doesn't work because in fact, you stand for what you tolerate. You should not ever be a hostage to that bad employee because she's the only one who knows how to use your software or because you know she you worry that if you let her go she's going to leave and take your patients with her that's not going to happen but what will happen is she will drive your good employees away the cost of keeping the wrong employee is 15 times of their annual salary and when you hold on to that negative grumpy, judgy people, you spend so much time trying to motivate them and manage them and hold them accountable. But it's costing you a lot of money and it's costing you a lot of aggravation. And the only thing that it does, it spoils the rest of the barrel. It drives you good employees away and it brings down the productivity of the entire office. There's been done a study that's been done that showed that when you have a negative person in your practice, it drives the production of the entire team down by 30%. So don't let these people be there and, and ruin your barrel because when you hire motivated people, you don't have to motivate them and hold them accountable. A good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Lang says that most people think that the role of a leader is to come up with all the ideas. And I always thought that my role was to provide clarity. And 
This is really a problem in a lot of dental offices. We don't communicate well. We think that we are, um, um, you know, setting expectations and communicating and telling people what to do, but a lot of times we're not clear enough. We must set clear expectations and explain what success will look like if we expect our team to produce good results. We need to paint a very specific picture. Remember I was talking about that vivid vision? Make sure that you are very clear. If you ask your employee, let's call her Daisy, to create a productive schedule for you, you have to make sure that, that you're on the same page because your idea of a productive schedule may look very different from Daisy's idea of a productive schedule. So be clear, be specific. Because if your employees are constantly not meeting your expectations, it's on you. You are not being clear enough. You of course, you have to make sure that you provide sufficient resources and you have to provide training. We already talked about that. So you have to create everything possible for them to set, to, to, to meet your expectations. But you have to be very clear about what those expectations are. You have to be very clear of, about what success will look like if you want them to accomplish the right thing. I don't want Axel Rose prepping a crown on me. I don't know what kind of chamfer Bruce Springsteen can cut. I don't imagine Eddie Van Halen understands depth cuts. Don't teach me how to prep like a rock star. Teach me to prep like a boring prosthodontist, Dr. Joshua Austin. Now, Dr. Josh Austin is a friend of mine and one of the speakers that you're going to be hearing from in the next couple of days. And I absolutely love this quote because we often talk about rock stars, hiring rock stars, right? We all want to hire rock stars. We say things like, in fact, I've seen ads, hiring ads, employment ads that say, looking for a rock star hygienist to join our team of superstars. But here's the problem with that. The problem is that rock stars are very hard to find. And if you find them, they're hard to keep because rock stars want to work with other rock stars. And the biggest problem with that is when you depend on a rock star to carry your entire team and you find that rock star and you bring her in or her, him, and this rock star starts to work and produce and you become dependent, you're afraid to lose that person. That's how we come up with those prima donnas, you know, the, the ones that are producing great results, but they don't have the right core values for us. So instead of looking for rock stars, why don't you create an environment of autonomy and responsibility where every person that you have on your team can grow? I mean, what do rock stars do anyway? Like, do they jam all day and then, you know, break the furniture, get high? No, like what is your definition of a great employee? It's a person who comes in on time. It's a person who takes responsibility. It's a person who is low drama. What kind of rock star is that anyway? I mean, have you met a rock star who's low drama? No. So we need to create an environment where every person on our team can have their autonomy and be responsible for their work. Let's talk about this. How do we do this? Because that's not easy, right? Ben Horowitz said, when you expect your employees to act like adults, they generally do. If you treat them like children, they get ready for your company to turn into one big Barney episode. I love this quote because we often talk about treating our employees like children. We say things like, our employees are like children. And we we mean that. I mean, we, we assume that, that our employees are there to do the least work possible. We say things like, you know, if when the cat is away, the mice will start to play. And that's the reason why we're so afraid to delegate. That's the reason why we think that, you know, if we step away from the practice for a second, people will not be doing their work. That couldn't be further from the truth. If you treat people like children, then you will 
get children's work. But if you treat people like adults, then you will get adult behavior. So treat your employees like adults. No one gets in the morning, does their hair, gets in the car, drives to work with an idea of screwing it all up for you. No one does that. And, and unfortunately, we often treat our employees like children by creating the manuals and the books and the checklists and our employees are required to ask permission for everything, right? It's like they have to get a hallway pass just to go to the bathroom. Who can do this? When we start to micromanage people like this, we don't get people who want to step up and take responsibility. When we make policies that don't make sense, we don't get employees who are willing to step up and speak up. So we need to treat them like adults. We need to, to, to give them responsibility and expect great things. Because when you expect great things, great things will happen. Employees are often like task rabbits. We give assignments and they go do something, but then they come back when decision needs to be made. Mike McAllowicz. One of the greatest books that I read was by Mike McCullerix. It's called The Clockwork, and I highly recommend that anyone who's running a business reads this book. Now, of all the books that I quoted in this presentation, this is the book. This is If you read one book, this is the book to read. It's called The Clockwork. And this is so true. How do we delegate? This is the problem with delegation. We delegate something to them. And then they have to come back and ask for the next step, right? They come back when the decision needs to be made. Because we don't, we delegate tasks, we don't delegate decisions. And that's a problem. If we want people to get things done, we need to create the culture of thinkers. We need to create the culture in which people, people that we employ can make decisions, not just tasks. In fact, a great friend of mine, Dr. Howard Ferran says, trust your employees to do their job. You cannot give someone a responsibility without giving the authority to make it happen. See, this is important. Two of the greatest leaders, Dr. Howard Ferran and Dr. Uh, and not Dr. Uh, Mike Michalowicz, um, say the same thing. You have to give people the authority to make decisions and to make things happen. You obviously have to provide the tools, right? You have to provide uh, training. You have to set clear expectations. You have to explain what a good result is going to look like when it's accomplished. But most importantly, you have to give the authority to make things happen. And this is tricky. Because when we give authority, we also have to do it in a way that people feel safe. Simon Sinek says, a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. And this is critical. Trust is critical. So as a practice owner, you are the DDS. You give direction. You, give, you provide development and you give support. Let's talk about this really quickly. Um, direction, we already talked about that. You create a vision. You share your vision. And that vision has to be detailed. It has to be very specific. Your vision has to trickle down to your employees. You set clear expectations. You tell them what success is going to look like. You provide training, that's your development piece. You provide training. One of the things that I like to do in my practice is when someone comes to me with a question, I don't answer it right away. In fact, Mike Michalowicz says that people are like rivers. They will flow in the easiest direction. And that's so true. I mean, what could be easier for an employee than to come to you and ask a question? But when you answer that question, two things happen. One, you teach your employee that that's the way you want things done. You want those questions. Every time you answer a question, you communicate to your employee 
that they're not capable of making the decision themselves and they need to come to you for everything. This is how we become those sweaty juggling hamsters running on a treadmill of life, unable to delegate because every decision comes through us. But the second thing happens, and that's even worse, is we teach ourselves that we're indispensable. Our heads grow. We start to, to think that without us, nothing will happen. And that couldn't be more possible from the truth, further from the truth. So what I like to do is when someone comes to me with a question, I don't answer it. I actually ask them, what do you think should be done? And you know what? Most of the time, they give me the right answer because you shared your vision, you set the expectations, you created clarity, you hired the right people who fit your core values. Why would they make the right decision? You gave them plenty of training, right? So they're going to make the right decision most of the time. And when they do that, two things happen. One, they learn that they're capable of making decisions. They don't need to come to you for everything. And number two, is that you will realize that you are not the most important person in the practice. And that's critical if you want the practice to run itself. That's the CEO part. You are not the most important person. You said the vision, you said the clarity, you, you provide resources and training, but you don't do everything. Other people do your work because they know how. That's the most important part of this, this entire presentation. And of course, you got to provide training. You have to provide more training. I don't care how much training you're providing now. Do more. You can, we can never have enough training for employees. And you know what's important is that for, for those employees that are working for us, that growth is critical. There's not a lot of upward mobility in the dental practice, right? I mean, someone starts working in the front office, most likely they'll just keep working in the front office for the next 20, 30 years. But the more they learn, the more they know, the better they become at their job. That's the fulfillment piece that they need to know that they're moving somewhere in life. And when they come to you for a race, you're not gonna feel so bad giving it to them. You're not gonna feel like, oh, you know, the, the, the earth rotated around the sun and now I have to give um, another race. You're gonna feel like they've earned it because they're doing so much more because they're becoming uh, a more critical piece of your practice. And you have to give them support and safety. Remember what Simon Sinek said? You're not going to get anyone to stand up and speak up and make decisions if every time they make a wrong decision, you bite their head off. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is they're going to get nervous about making decisions. And if they feel criticized, they'll never make another decision again. So whether they make good decisions or bad decisions, you have to support them. And you have to actually care for them uh, like humans. Because you know what? If you make their dreams come true, they will go through brick walls for you. So be a go-giver, not a go-getter. As Sheryl Sandberg famously said, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. So we have um, uh, an offer for you. If you're interested about in, in Yappy, you can text us to 66866 and we will um, send you a link to a uh, to take a presentation. And uh, if you take a demo of the software, you will also get a gift card. So uh, let us know if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Yappy. And I am going to exit my screen and take some questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, let me get our host back in here. What a presentation, doctor. Um, Dr. Sandeep, I can't uh, hear you. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I was listening. There you go. Yeah, it was wonderful and um, a wonderful presentation. And I believe everybody needs uh, 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 something to manage their practice. And if they have multiple uh, clinics, it's very important to to have somebody who is looking after your clinic. Uh, 
trustworthy. That's very important. So to develop that trust, as she said, you have to have uh, create a lot of communication. That's what I believe. You know, there has to be communication between your your employees, and and especially if you are if you have the dental surgeons working with you. Uh, I, as in my practice, I don't treat them as a, a as an employee. You know, they are my associates. And uh, another thing is teamwork. Teamwork is very important. So uh, training, how do, you, how do you manage the training part with your associates? So one of the things that I do actually, and remember I, the very first part is um, setting expectations from the beginning. So one of the things that I do before I hire an associate is I have a document that I wrote a few years ago that sort of goes over my treatment philosophy. Because I don't want, if someone is coming into my practice and they have certain beliefs, I want to make sure that they have their autonomy to make the, their decisions. They're doctors, they should, you know, I, I don't want anyone standing over their shoulder watching their work and, and being critical. So I created this document that I, I call it my clinical philosophy and it goes over sort of my expectations of anyone who's working with me. And before they're hired, I say, okay, read this. And if you're not okay with that, if that doesn't work for you, then don't take this job. And I think that's important because they know what I'm about from the very beginning. And I also know that whoever is coming in is on the same page with me. That's critical for me. And then of course, we're, you know, obviously I don't train as far as, you know, dentistry beyond making sure that they take plenty of C's. I, I'm, uh, a CE junkie, I take a lot of um, education courses and uh, educational courses, and I always make sure that they're also attending those courses with me. Or um, if we're not able to attend together, then maybe we kind of, because, you know, if I'm away, uh, you know, I want to make sure that the practice is covered, but we uh, we stagger. So I'll take a course on one day and then they'll take a course on, on a different um, day. Um, but again, it's important that we're taking the same courses and that they're growing as much as I grow. A lot of times, a lot of dentists, unfortunately, hire an associate and, and they give them sort of small jobs, right? And then the, the main doctor takes all of the gravy and that's not how it is in my practice. There's no cherry picking. Um, the associates get the same kinds of patients that I'm getting. Um, in fact, they see most of the patients. And and uh, and so um, I want to make sure that they're as well trained as I am. But we also do something else. We do um, weekly meetings with the team. We obviously do huddles in the morning where we talk about the schedule. We do weekly meetings with the team. Um, we do a monthly, like entire office meeting. We close the office for a couple of hours and we, we just, you know, we train during those meetings on, um, customer service, on workflow. Um, in fact, yesterday, actually, we, we finally got to open my practice, uh, after eight weeks of not being there. And so before we opened, we had this whole morning, we had spent half a day on training our team on the new workflows that we have to utilize during this pandemic to make sure that everyone is staying safe. And, and that's that's very important for us. And so it was wonderful to get the feedback. I, I know a lot of um, um, a lot of team members are worried about going back uh, to work and um, about their safety. And it was great to have the feedback from my team that they felt comfortable because they saw how much thought and, and work we put into the, the, the new workflow. And you, you've got to do this for, for everything. So whenever we introduce something new, that's very common. Doctor goes to a continuous education course, but the team doesn't go. And then the doctor comes back and they try to explain, okay, this is how we're going to do things. Um, that doesn't happen in my practice. We all go, we all get trained. Um, so what is yeah. Uh, what is, yeah. What is your suggestion for that? Uh, like in India, India. Like uh, if I am not good into orthodontics, you know, I don't do that. I'm more into endodontic uh, practice and implants and perio. That's all. My my expertise are these 
so if i if you need somebody who is like so would you rec uh, you refer your patients you recommend to get it referred to other practices or like in india we call we have a specialist visiting specialist like an orthodontist he comes down he does the practice and and then it is like uh, uh, sharing so uh, with my associates what i do is like do you recommend this like i give them uh, this that you need to do this and and uh, this part is by done by if if my associate is good enough to do an endo treatment i would not like anybody else to take that case other than i'm mean, like from beginning till the end he's the one or she's the one who is going to take care of it nobody barges in and takes away this case so do you recommend this thing yeah so i have um in my practice i have two general dentists um i have a pediatric dentist i have um an endodontist and an oral surgeon placing implants and extractions bone grafts that kind of thing um and so it's it's very specialized where a general dentist will typically do a lot of general dentistry they might do like a simple extraction or a simple endo but for the most part molar endo goes to the endodontist um younger children again my general associates might see children who are older but younger kids go to the pediatric dentist um and so again this is this is part of that vision that i was talking about we don't just hire people and let them do whatever there's a very specific um you know sort of delegation responsibility and i have in my practice what i call sops which is a, a standard operating procedure we have it for everything i have four binders one for doctors, one for uh, hygienists, one for front office, um, one for dental assistants, and it's very clear who does what. And and here's the thing: in a typical dental practice, there's a lot of sort of back and forth between. You know, sometimes the front office will do something, and the back office will not agree with that, or the the dentist will start doing something, and the front office schedules differently but when you have those sops when you have that vision when you have all of that regimented then there's no problem between people because everyone knows what they're doing and what the expectation is this is part of of, of having that clarity and i you know you, your example was was perfect um if you know molar endo goes to this and the dentist otherwise why have an endodontist right if if anyone can have I, I think you said at it or like barges in the middle of treatment. We don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a question uh, that uh, how what do you have to say about the balance between encouraging and guiding employees? Uh, how do you maintain this? The balance, the the encouragement and the guidance. Right. That's that, that's an excellent question. So in the beginning, there's more guidance um when when i first hire someone and i sort of again this is this is part of the, the hiring process we tell them what they're going to expect and so in the beginning there's going to be a lot of guidance we're going to teach you how to do everything now i when we answer our phone we answer in a specific way and i don't care where you worked before in fact a lot of times i would prefer to hire an a less experienced employee because then it's easier for me to teach them the way I want to do things than to retrain them. I don't want to have anyone coming in with an attitude that, oh, but in that practice, I used to do things differently. So, you know, I want to keep doing things this way. This is part of the core values, being flexible and doing things. So in the beginning, there's a lot of guiding. This is how we do things. This is the, this is the SOP, read the SOP, watch the videos. We have training videos for them. Um, and it takes a lot of time to create, but here's the nice thing. Once you create it, you use it over and over again. Because typically in a dental practice, how do we train employees? Someone has to sit next to them and, and they get trained. Or we assume that they're sort of going to get trained by osmosis, right? Like somehow if they just sit in the front or like if, you know, we're going to put an assistant to work and somehow she's going to learn how to assist from the other assistant, right? That's not going to happen. So in the beginning, there is a lot of sort of guiding and, and training. And then what happens is 
And after a certain amount of time, it's more like, okay, you got this. So don't ask me how to do this. Tell me how you think this should be done. And again, what happens is once we ask them, what do you think needs to be done? And they tell us, um, it, you know, it, all of a sudden they, they become um, like they have wings all of a sudden, you know, they can make decisions. So yesterday, actually, I brought up the, the example of, of reopening the office. So we had the training and I had the floor in the beginning talking about how I want the workflow and I had this whole document typed up. Um, and I also had this guidance from the American Dental Association. So I came in with a lot of, you know, instructions and so forth. And, um, and then I said, you know, we, this is my first pandemic. You know, I don't really have all the answers. This is what I think is going to happen. But I know that as we go into this, things will be different. And one of my front office, not even the office manager, but just one of the front office employees said, I know that there will be problems. And I'd like for you, I encourage you to bring those problems to us, but don't just come with a problem, bring a solution to. I don't come in and say, this isn't working. Come in and say, this isn't working, but can we try to do something else? And I think that's, that's really critical to encourage people to come up with solutions. And if they don't have a good solution, you just say, you know, let's try again. Let's try something different. But if they have a good solution, then, um, it's it's very important to to really um, celebrate that you know and then they're going to be encouraged to do more yeah i have a question that like when somebody joins in like uh, for a specialist definitely it's your choice because you have to go to the see the credentials and everything and then you need to know that you must be knowing that person and then you invite them to your practice but if somebody like a general dentist comes and wants to join my practice, what what do you suggest to 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 check? Because personally, if you ask me, and if I have to tell that, I tell them that look, I'm not gonna let you touch my patient for at least three months, not before that. Because I have put my 25 years of practice, 20, 25 years of practice, I have uh, gather the confidence of my patients and they won't let you touch immediately. They need to see you as an integral part of the clinic. And then once they get accustomed, then only they allow. So what do you, what do you recommend on to this part? So one of the things that I do when I hire a dentist um, is, first of all, I have to say that I've been very fortunate and maybe it's part of, I'd like to think that it's part of how I run my business, but I've been very fortunate that I have um, a lot of long-term associates. I know that um, sometimes some practices complain that it's kind of like a treadmill of associates. You know, somebody comes in, two years later, they're gone. And of course, I've had some that started, and then a couple of years later, they started their own practice. Um, but I also had, uh, for example, my, my surgeon, um, He's been with me since 2003. Um, I, you know, couple of, I've had dentists who's been with me maybe eight years, nine years, so long term. Um, and part of the reason I think is because how we treat them and, um, and how, how we onboard them, how we treat them. But another great thing is that the dentists that are working for me right now all have been referred by previous associates. So again, that's kind of a testament to how we do things in, in my practice. But to answer your question, what we do is actually, as a part of the interview, we set up um, uh, a um, pro, um, is it called pro bono? Uh, we set up like a complimentary day where we see yeah. each other. Now the dentist still get paid, gets paid. I pay, pay like a flat rate for the day, um, but all of the patients who are coming in are getting complimentary dentistry. Um, and usually we just pull from the, you know, the patients that tell us over the years that I need to have something done, but I can't afford it. Um, but um, the what happens is I usually have my most uh, experienced assistant with them. We take uh, photos, we take uh, post-operative x-rays, we take models of their work. And so I can evaluate their work, but more importantly, I can also see their chair side manner. 
And um, it's wonderful because, you know, my cost is minimal. It's just a daily rate. Um, but we do a lot of, you know, good dentistry for people. And I'm able to see what they're like. Yeah, I, I, there is a question from one of the viewers. Uh, her name is Yoshiatsu Tanaka. I think she's from Japan or somewhere. She's asking female staff sometimes staff, not staff. Female staff sometimes do don't want to discuss with male dentists about some topics. So would you recommend to transfer authority to some female manager to discuss with female staff? That's yeah. an interesting question. You know, I I don't have that issue in my practice. Um, I employ both male and female employees, and I don't really. I've asked. The, I'm often asked about you know gender because obviously you know I've had I've had the flip side of that question where someone says you know the uh, female boss female employees may not respect the female boss as much. I haven't really noticed any gender difference. Um, I think that. A lot of times we assume it's the gender, but it's really lack of leadership skills that the prop that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, I uh, think that sometimes men may lead differently and they probably don't listen as much. In general, I think females just listen more. And that might okay. be a problem there. But 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 I I I my feeling is is just lack of leadership rather than the gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is one of the biggest advantage on being in in US. So United States, it's, things are different. But if you look towards Asia or the Middle East, you have to have a female dentist with you if you are seeing uh, somebody uh, from specific religion, a uh, Muslim lady or somebody. You have to have a, a a female dentist or female assistant along with you it's very important especially in india so uh it was wonderful having you here with us and uh, there is last question which is there that is this software globally uh, operating i mean like anybody out of us wants to use this software is it uh, possible uh, this this so question comes from this question comes from ata mustafa latif um, it's okay. So it's not available in India. It's not available in, um, in anywhere in Asia, but it, we're in Canada, we're in Jamaica and, uh, we might go globally one day, but right now we're limited in resources. So if you have good programmers, let me know. Yeah. Here is the opportunity. You are there in front of, uh, the whole world and, uh, with the global summit, there you uh, go. I think I think you uh, you'll be able to launch a global launch. Uh, this is the right uh, place. That's, and, and that's right. That's right. Yeah. The preview. Yeah. <laughs> the preview. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. That, uh, just to uh, also state that she's starting to expand. If you guys have uh, anywhere from the world that wants to reach out to Dr. Uh, Dorfman, what would be the best place? How would they reach out to you, Dr. Dorfman? So my email address is uh, drgina at yappycentral.com. But I'm also, I spend a lot of time on Facebook. So that's that's a very easy way to get in touch with me. And boy, is yeah. she active there. <laughs> uh, go ahead and I'm going to put her email in the lower right here. Uh, it should be in the comments yeah. section. If you guys have ideas for Dr. Dorfman, on how to expand this brilliant concept that she has built uh, into different countries, we would uh, really appreciate it. Um, and if you reach out to her, she, uh, remember it was a it's a peer-to-peer -peer operation here, and this is uh, was uh, invented and uh, made by one of our own. Uh, with that said, Dr. Sandeep, thank you for a wonderful moderating session, and Thanks, continue to do what you do for our profession. Yeah. Uh, look forward to have you many more times, as well as Dr. Dorfman. And the day will be all 150 plus dentists that are, have been working on this project. We wrote history together, and let's continue yeah. to bring good things to the profession of dentistry. Our duty. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Gina. You. And uh, uh, one more thing before we leave. 
uh, we missed a picture of your clinic uh, associates and clinical staff. You should have. I I don't think it was there. Uh, a big picture of your clinical staff together. Let me see. Was it somewhere in the in the in the? It's on my website. I can. Um... Oh, here I can get to it real quick. Um, is that the yeah. doctor? It's yourdentist.net. Yourdentist.net. Let's put it up. Uh, yeah, yeah. A request was made, and a request shall be honored. Let me get this into the link session real quick, and then we will go ahead and put the media in. I went from a dentist to 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 being able to navigate these uh these <laughs> these things quite well over the last month. Let me tell you. Uh, okay, let's let me see if I can pull it off the web. Show in the stream and take this one off. Take this one off. Take this one off. Okay, let's see if we can get uh, it to show. I just got the link, guys. That's a beautiful picture, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us more about that picture? I don't see it. I'm assuming it's the picture of, of my team with the doctor yeah. sitting in front yes it visible. is so it's the, not visible. the yeah i don't see it uh right now on the screen but um, on, I'll get it. i'm still working on it i'm still working on it so the yeah i think it's coming now 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 yeah. it's coming hang on something is happening something is happening hang on guys <laughs> <Be> <laughs> So the wonderful thing about my team is that many have been with me for, 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 for years and years and not just the dentist, but, but the team, uh, my, uh, practice administrator came to me straight out of dental assisting school and I didn't even need anyone at that time, but I interviewed her and she was just, she was on fire. Like you, I felt that amazing energy from her. And I, so I decided to, to hire her. And she started with some, I don't know, like scanning or something like that. That was before even we, we had Yappy and, and paperless. And, and so um, she's just become, over time, she moved, you know, to one job and then another within my practice. And then eventually she's, right now she's running the practice. I'm there usually one, sometimes two days a week. Um, I see patients near six hours a week usually, and then the rest of the time is just mainly administrative. And she's running the whole show. She's been with me for over 15 years now, uh, and she really grew. Um, and uh, oh, there it is. There oh, it is. boy. I was screenshotting and cropping and all that good stuff. Here you go. <laughs> so there, there, there she is. There she is. Um, uh, go ahead and hide us so everyone can uh, get a good idea of what Dr. Dorfman does on her free time. I mean, on the on the professional side of things. And with that said, um, it is uh, yourdentist.net. You're welcome to visit yeah. it. I'll put that up there. And that's a beautiful picture to, to lady professionals, to doctor professionals, and a wonderful support yeah. staff behind us that supports yeah. the operation. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I'm you. very proud yeah. of my team. They they carry the operation. They get things done for me. So, um, and, and that's you know, wonderful. They've, they've, many of them have been there for many, many years. So, it's quite it was it's quite quite amazing it was quite an honor right. to have you dr dorfman yeah. and dr singh and uh yeah with you guys uh, a very uh good and uh strong weeks ahead as we overcome this COVID thing and get back with more knowledge and information to care for our patients thank you thank you bye-bye yeah. bye-bye Bye. good night and uh, the, the namaste from India. Namaste. namaste. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the global greeting these days, post COVID and COVID. No <laughs> such thing. I've been I've been elbowing everybody. <laughs> no no hugging, no touching. Just namaste and um, stay safe. Take care, guys. <laughs>
Bye. Bye.